Thank you for joining World Shared Practice Forum. Today we are trialing a new format called Master Teacher Series, in which expert clinicians in the field of critical care share their experiences and clinical insights through a series of cases about critically ill patients. Unlike most World Shared Practice Forums, there will be no discussion questions during this video. However, if you would like to ask a question or leave a comment, please feel free to do so at any time. Thank you and we hope you enjoy this video. Welcome to World Shared Practice Forum. I'm Dr. Jeff Burns, Chief of Critical Care at Boston Children's Hospital and Harvard Medical School. We're very pleased to have with us today, Dr. David Wessel. Dr. Wessel is the Executive Vice President and Chief Medical Officer at the Children's National Medical Center in Washington, DC. He is also a Professor of Anesthesia and Pediatrics at the George Washington University School of Medicine. Dave, welcome. Thank you, Jeff, for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be back here today. Uh, Dr. David Wessel, uh, thank you for coming back um, for the World Share Practice Forum. In an earlier session, you outlined the growth and development of the field of pediatric cardiac intensive care. And as you know, we've asked you to come back, and many colleagues around the world indeed have asked you to come back, so that we could talk further about um, really classic and traditional care practices in the field of pediatric cardiac intensive care unit. And in particular, with a focus on really what are some of maybe the foundational principles that one should recall. And at the same time, uh, some of the uh, misconceptions in the care of the patient in the cardiac intensive care unit. Could you uh, tell us a little bit about how you think about these issues? Sure, Jeff, and thank you for having me back. So that last time when we discussed cardiac intensive care, we spoke of it as a journey, and certainly it's been a journey over the last two, three, four decades. Uh, but we also mentioned that there were certain lessons learned. And some of those lessons, I think, represented dogma uh, when I was first training, uh, that we've uh, learned to think differently about those aspects of care. Our thinking has evolved, and now we approach them differently than we did at the beginning of this era. On the other hand, there are also lessons that we need to relearn. And I think as teachers, we need to reteach. Uh, and those represent some of the principles that really apply, have always applied uh, to this arena. Uh, and I think we need to emphasize again. And so that's what my hope is today, that we can have a discussion. We can talk about some of those uh, special areas, uh, some of the special cases. And I just have a series of vignettes, some scenarios. And a lot of them are particular events that are burned in my memory because I lived through those circumstances. And I remember the basic physiology and the basic principles that applied and may have gone awry in that particular instance. So hopefully this is a, a conversation, not a lecture. And it's about some of the stories that I'd like to share with uh, you and with others who are watching. Well, Dave, um I, I know I'm looking forward to this as our colleagues around the world. And in particular, I recall you talking to all of us as we were training about the importance of basic principles in the intensive care unit, such as the alveolar gas equation. So Jeff, I'd love to uh, tell a story to first year cardiology fellows and actually set them up with a little scenario and ask them what they think the answer is. And uh, here's how the story goes. There's a seven year old boy who's involved in a motor vehicle accident. He's rushed into an emergency room, and before uh, we can really provide any intervention whatsoever, we see that he's got cuts and bruises. Uh, he doesn't seem to be uh, conscious. Uh, his mental status is clearly impaired. Uh, he's got blood across his chest. There may be a wound over in the left side. And before anyone can do anything, Almost before he even gets into the room, some pesky little medical student slips under your arm, puts that butterfly into the radio artery and gets a blood gas. And the blood gas comes back with a pH of 719, a PCO2 of 79, and a PO2 of 49. So I asked the cardiology and the cardiac ICU fellows, how much pulmonary parenchymal disease does this child with a PO2 of 49 really have? And so I say, your choices are a lot, a little, a medium amount, or maybe none at all. And the focus you can see is really on the PO2. And the answers invariably are either a lot or a moderate amount. 
And then we worked through the alveolar gas equation, and we realized that this patient, and I, I've taken them down a little bit of a rose path, so they'll give me the, the wrong answers, because my teaching style is a little bit Socratic, and if people keep giving me the right answers, then I have nothing to talk about. So they tell me that there's a lot of lung disease because the PO2 is 49. I remind them that there was no intervention provided and the patient was breathing room air. And what's really important to remember in the alveolar gas equation is when you're breathing room air and your PCO2 goes up, as in this child's case, because of hypoventilation from uh, central nervous system trauma, then the PO2 must go down as dictated by the alveolar gas equation. So if your PCO2 goes from 40 to 79, your PO2 is going to go down by that delta divided by the respiratory quotient, say 0.8. And so in fact, the alveolar arterial gradient in the patient I just described with a PO2 of 49 breathing room air is normal. There's no pulmonary parenchymal disease. There's no need to rush with that chest tube. We need to provide ventilation and importantly, oxygenation for the patient. That's really important in congenital heart disease and the management of patients who first of all may be blue because of their cyanotic heart disease, but also there's a real emphasis in cardiology about testing in room air and when we're in the ICU with our patients with hypoplastic left heart syndrome who've had a Norwood type operation, why we try to get them down to an FiO2 of 0.21, get them to room air, and so much emphasis on room air. But I had an incredible memory of a patient when I was in training, and I just finished my anesthesia training. It was a cyanotic patient with heart disease, was coming in for an elective admission, it got up to the ward a little bit early, and the decision was made to send him over to another building to have his echocardiogram performed. And at the time, this infant uh, was then sedated with chloral hydrate, large dose of chloral hydrate. And he went soundly to sleep in the parents' arms, and the parents themselves, not with a healthcare worker, uh, left the main building, crossed over into the ambulatory building, and went up to where echocardiograms were being done. And by the time they arrived and negotiated the elevators, uh, they looked at their child, and he was not breathing, was very blue. He had no heart rate when he arrived, and he died. And what I think undoubtedly happened in that child is that he simply hypoventilated. He had a little bit of airway issue. He was given uh, sedation. He was in an unmonitored environment and his PCO2 goes up, and the PO2 must go down. So the message to take away here is that a little bit of oxygen in sedated patients is really important. When you look at the alveolar gas equation, and you've got barometric pressure minus water vapor pressure, so it gives you a little over 700, 713, 5% more oxygen is another 36 PO2s, if you will. So if you put increased alveolar PO2, that provides an enormous buffer against hypoxia if the PCO2 goes up. So we really have to remind our folks to supplement the patient with oxygen if you're going to sedate them and they might hypoventilation. So hypoventilation is one of the major causes of hypoxemia. And we have to remember that, especially as we deal with children with congenital heart disease, whether it's in the ICU or somewhere else uh, in, in the program. The last thing I'd like to mention is this carries over into the treatment of hypoplastic left heart syndrome after a Norwood operation, when if we think there's quite a lot of pulmonary blood flow, we drive the FiO2 down to 21% fairly quickly. And here we have a child with you know, a form body that goes in the nose and down into the trachea that we're ventilating him through. We put him on room air, and there are lots of things that can happen to obstruct the airway. Maybe the endotracheal tube kinks a little bit, uh, <clears throat> or the child hypoventilates for other reasons that are related to medications we're giving him. And as the CO2 rises in those patients, the alveolar PO2 goes down, and they become hypoxic. 
And as humans, we deal pretty well with high CO2s, but not with hypoxemia. And so we see events in the intensive care unit that could be protected against by giving them just 25 or 26% oxygen, not 21% oxygen. So I'm a big advocate of avoiding 21% oxygen and try to give just a little bit more FiO2 because I don't think it has a huge impact on drastically lowering PPR and exacerbating pulmonary blood flow, but it does protect against the hypoxia from hypoventilation. Um, so Dave, could I follow up on that? Um, and, and your point is so well taken that we forget these basic principles. Um, but I wanted to ask you also this about the vignette with the patient who's sedated but breathing spontaneously. And as you rightly pointed out, um, the failure of supplemental oxygen in that situation can lead to unnecessary hypoxemia um, if it's not appreciated that the CO2 is rising. There are colleagues around the world who might respond this way and say, oh, we appreciate that fact, but we prefer not to add uh, supplemental oxygen in the situation where we're sedating a spontaneously breathing patient for a procedure because we're concerned that it may mask some hypoventilation and CO2 retention and that we uh, seek to identify hypoventilation once we see the patient desaturating because we're monitoring now most, if not all, these patients with uh, continuous pulse oximetry. So I, I think that's the main point is that what I described was clearly a different era when we sedated a patient, albeit with chloral hydrate, but then uh, the patient went off in the mother's arms alone without a healthcare practitioner there and without monitoring, uh, left the building, went to the next building. And that really is not happening in the current era. So I think monitoring, of course, is the key. Uh, but then I think it's a matter of uh, what trigger would you prefer to have if you're monitoring rather than what protections should you put in place in advance. And for me, rather than waiting for the pulse oximetry to um, show a decrease in oxygenation, and then for me to speculate that maybe the ba baby is hypoventilating and examine the child, which is critically important, I would rather observe the patient, monitor the patient, and then treat with a little bit of supplemental oxygen, knowing that I've sedated him and the respiratory rate may be going down. He may be susceptible to hypoventilation and then alveolar hypoxia. So I would just as soon not use hypoxia and an alarm monitor uh, for oxygen telling me that the child is hypoventilating. I'd rather provide the oxygen and then monitor the child in other ways to see if there's evidence of hypoventilation. David, I wonder if we could move on now to uh, newborn physiology. Um, as you well recognize and have written so much about, uh, the newborn physiology is uniquely distinct from a school-aged child or an adolescent. What are some of the foundational principles we should understand about care of the newborn in the cardiac intensive care unit? Well, Jeff, we know that the newborn is going to present it with cer certain challenges. Uh, they have less metabolic reserve. Their structures are all smaller. Uh, when they uh, have a higher metabolic rate and they use oxygen from their alveolar reservoir more quickly, why they're going to get blue faster. And so there are a number of issues, including the, uh, the myocardium itself, which uh, in its immature fashion at birth requires uh, more support, responds differently to drugs than the older child. So indeed, there are challenges for us, but there are also great advantages. Uh, the opportunity to in intervene with a reparative operation in the newborn period provides us uh, with the notion that we can eliminate cyanosis, we can eliminate congestive failure, uh, we can also send the baby home not palliated and subject to the uh, complications and ramifications of a palliated circulation, which will, will require subsequent operations. Uh, and we also give the family who's had a repaired child in the newborn period uh, the opportunity to know that they have a corrected circulation as opposed to a circulation that they are going to constantly need to monitor and look for when the next operation needs to be done. So for the child with two ventricles, we think there are great uh, opportunities and advantages to try to do reparative surgery early in life. And that's been a tenet of this field for, for actually many, many years. 
Uh, there are some concerns that we had at the beginning. Uh, I was told, for example, that we really shouldn't be operating on newborns because we all know they're going to have pulmonary hypertensive crisis when they come off of cardiopulmonary bypass. And in fact, that turns out not to be the case very often at all. Uh, there are good examples. Truncus arteriosus is one example where we saw that if one operates with reparative surgery in the early period of life, say in the first three weeks or four weeks of life, you're going to see a lot less postoperative pulmonary hypertension than you would if you took that same child and waited until they were bigger uh, and at three months or four months of age, you then do repair of truncus arteriosus. Truncus, as you recall, is, is a lesion where there's a massive amount of pulmonary blood flow and high pressure uh, to the vessels in the lung. By the time the children are three or four months of age, they really have a lot of smooth muscle hypertrophy in the pulmonary vasculature. They've got the propensity to really vasoconstrict in the period after cardiopulmonary bypass, which we had shown in earlier work as a very vulnerable period, uh, and uh, the children are prone to pulmonary hypertension. But in reality, the newborn is more protected against the pulmonary hypertensive crisis in truncus for sure than that older patient. So there are a number of advantages. Uh, our therapies in the early days were really focused uh, on trying to prevent the newborn from having a pulmonary hypertensive crisis. So the early dogma was you'd bring the patients up from bypass, the first thing you do is warm them up because they didn't need to be cold. That would intensify their pulmonary vasoconstriction. So we put heat lamps on the babies and we heated them up. And in fact, we often overheated them. And then we hyperventilated them prophylactically. And we would take their pHs up to 7.6 and their PCO2s down to the 20s because we didn't want them to have a pulmonary hypertensive crisis. Uh, and in fact, we see now that not only did not really that affect pulmonary vascular resistance very much, but it probably harmed children in the sense that you're overheating them, you're increasing their metabolic rate, you're increasing brain temperature, and then you're hyperventilating them and probably decreasing cerebral blood flow. So that's a, a very old dogma that we've really tried to approach differently. David, are there specific lesions in the uh, newborn in the postoperative period that bring some of these lessons to, uh, to mind? Well, let me talk about one that uh, I was reminded of uh, very recently in our institution. Um, and there we have 24-7 video monitoring in every bed space in the cardiac intensive care unit. So 27 video monitors enable us to review every detail of every event that happens in, in the cardiac ICU. And I'm reminded of uh, this notion of tetralogy of Fallot and right to left shunning at the foramen level after reparative operation and the importance of, of letting that happen, permitting that to happen, and also the importance of understanding what is happening. So let me explain. In Tetralogy of Fallot, of course, the surgeon will typically open the right ventricular outflow tract, so there'll be an incision in the right ventricle, and then the VSD is closed, and then a patch uh, uh, is placed over the RV outflow tract to enlarge the obstruction. Now, uh, this is a hypertrophied right ventricle. It's been put on cardiopulmonary bypass. Uh, cold cardioplegia is infused into the heart. It's a, quite a little insult here and isn't going to be real happy in the immediate postoperative period. And so we, what we don't want to do is acutely increase the afterload on that, uh, on that right ventricle after its operation. We know that as the right ventricle fails a little bit, it's important for blood to be able to go right to left across the foramen because even though it's blue blood in a child who's used to being blue, by the way, it'll go right to left and it'll fill the left ventricle. And I always say that it's better to have a cardiac output with blue blood than to have a perfectly pink patient with no cardiac output. And so in some centers still around the country, there's uh, uh, around the world, there's a bit of a tendency for the surgeon to see the patent foramen in the three-week-old, four-week-old tetralogy patient and suture close the foramen. And for the postoperative period, that just leaves us without that right-to-left pop-off to fill the left ventricle if there's some additional dysfunction, failure, compliance, or afterload issue on the right ventricle. So leaving the foramen patent is important. Now, having said that, we in the intensive care unit have to understand uh, 
that if the right ventricle is failing, he will get blue, or the patient will get blue by going right to left. So recently I was looking at a video uh, of a patient who did have a cardiac arrest in our intensive care unit. He had a tetralogy of Fallot repair. The rep rep repair was uh, perfect. There was a right ventricular outflow tract incision. And in fact, the patient looked so good that we were thinking about extubating him that first night. And after about eight hours from the time of surgery, he was uh, waking up. We backed off the analgesia, the anesthetic altogether. We were going to wake him up and, and get him extubated, or at least consider him for extubation that first night. But as he woke up, he got agitated. He increased his thoracic pressure, lots of valsalva, the right atrial pressure goes up, and he shunts right to left and becomes blue as he gets more awake. But the interpretation of cyanosis was, oh my goodness, there must be something wrong with the airway. And so the reflex response far too often is to take this foreign body we call a suction catheter and stuff it down the endotracheal tube. And that, of course, just exacerbates the patient's problem. He does get more agitated. There's probably a reflex response uh, from suctioning the endotracheal tube that we showed years ago and gives the pulmonary vascular resistance a little elevation, which usually isn't too much of an issue in tetralogy of flow patients. That increases the afterload on the right ventricle. The right ventricle begins to fail more. And so there's even more shunning right to left. And so suctioning the endotracheal tube, yes, if you want to make sure the airway is patent, uh, we understand that that's uh, a, a good procedure to follow once. But in this particular case, we saw that the endotracheal tube was suctioned again. The patient was still blue, suctioned again. And over the course of 10 or 12 minutes, the patient was suctioned six times because he was blue. We also noticed on the monitor that the arterial pressure was damped. And so there was a lot of time in that 10 or 12 minutes of fiddling with the arterial line to flush it and as damped. And I just have to remind people that in a, even a fresh post-op cardiac patient, if you're worried that the A-line is damped, and this is a mechanical problem, versus a very low cardiac output state, uh, two or three judicious chest compressions with an arterial line that then goes up, up, up for those three compressions will tell you immediately that this is not a problem with a damped A-line, and one needs to intervene immediately to support cardiac output. So in this patient, we spent a lot of time worrying about the right to left shunting as representing an issue with the airway. And we exacerbated the afterload on the right ventricle, the right ventricular failure, the cyanosis got wor worse, and eventually the patient had a cardiac arrest. Was successfully resuscitated, but it points out both the value of the patent foramen in patients after repair of tetralogy, and also the way we need to think about it. I'm worried that suctioning the endotracheal tube in a post-op cardiac uh, patient population is one of the most toxic interventions that we provide. And just to tell you a little of the story, I remember that when Bill Norwood was first doing operations on patients with hypoplastic left heart syndrome, from time to time, he would write an order in the medical record, do not suction this patient for 24 hours. So I'm not suggesting that we should go to that uh, kind of approach, but it does sensitize us to the fact that suctioning the endotracheal tube um, in patients who uh, do have an established patent airway is often bad for the patient, especially when there's right ventricular dysfunction. Uh, David, could you talk to us about, uh, in particular, the high-risk newborn hypoplast hypoplastic left heart syndrome patients? Um, it used to be uh, that uh, Few of these patients survived, and those who did were seen as um, especially innovative examples of new therapies. But now, uh, these children survive, and there are a number of complicated issues related to the appropriate care of the patient with hypoplastic left heart syndrome. Well, Jeff, there are a lot of lessons learned in the saga of uh, surgical intervention for hypoplastic left heart syndrome. Uh, it's true we've made great progress uh, over the last many years. Obviously, the surgical techniques have been enormously uh, helpful in sorting out 
uh, how these patients can uh, thrive uh, and, and how their operations and interventions can be staged in a fashion that's very different from the early days. But just going back to the original Norwood operation, we were very much focused in those first two, three, four, five years on manipulating the pulmonary vascular resistance. Well, why was that? Well, you may remember that the smallest shunts that we had at that time were four millimeter shunts. It was either a, a biologic subclavian flap to the right pulmonary artery, or it was a four millimeter shunt. So we had a lot of pulmonary blood flow being stolen from the systemic circulation in the original cohort of patients who had hypoplastic left heart syndrome. And so there was a focus on trying to keep the pulmonary vascular resistance up to resist flooding of the lungs and stealing blood from the systemic circulation. I remember that uh, Bill Norwood showed me a slide one day of an old Siemens-style ventilator and said, this is the only thing I need to know to take care of patients after an operation for hypoplastic left heart syndrome. He didn't think I needed to know much about the drugs or the dopamine, and his point was it's all about manipulating pulmonary vascular resistance with the ventilator. And there was some truth to that. But what's happened in the more recent era, era is that we've got smaller shunts. They're three and a half millimeter shunts. And that shunt contributes to a substantial portion of the resistance to pulmonary blood flow. So let's take a heart that's a single ventricle. It pumps out to the circulation after a Norwood operation. And if it's perfectly balanced, one part of the circulation goes back to the lungs through that shunt and the other part goes out to the body. Let's say that the systemic vascular resistance is normal at 16, and if the QPQS is one, so it's a balanced circulation, then the total pulmonary circulation will have also a pulmonary vascular resistance total, including the shunt of 16. So they're both the same and it's balanced. But we know that on the distal end, in the pulmonary vasculature itself, the PVR is typically two, three, four wood units corrected for body surface area. Most of the resistance is in the shunt. And you can manipulate the PVR a little bit from two to three or even two to four, and the total resistance then that four plus 12 of the shunt is still 16, or maybe you can bring it down to 14, or maybe you move it up to 18, but it doesn't have a huge impact. What has a huge impact is if you can lower the systemic vascular resistance from 16 to eight to avoid patients who have systemic vasoconstriction. Uh, you can dilate those patients. So our focus turned more, thanks to the work that the people in Milwaukee and other places around the world did on manipulating the systemic vascular resistance, at least as much as concentrating on pulmonary vascular resistance. Uh, so reducing the shunt size, and then of course, uh, the modification of the sono shunt was important because there the diastolic blood flow that came into the lungs was eliminated for the most part because the sono shunt goes directly from the right ventricle out to the pulmonary artery. So here sits a ventricle and it's got a choice. It can go out the shunt to the lungs or out to the body. And what we learned is that manipulating the systemic vascular resistance had actually more of an impact than what we might be able to do with pulmonary vascular resistance, uh, especially trying to elevate it a little bit. So we learned a lot about that, but I do wanna come back to this notion of trying to get down to an FiO2 of 0.21 in these patients. We just have to remember that as soon as we get down to 21% oxygen, then we don't have that buffer to protect us from hypoventilation. So if the endotracheal tube kinks a little bit, or there's a problem with the airway and the CO2 bumps up 25 points, then the alveolar PO2 is gonna drop from its room air value to that 25 point delta divided by 0.8. So maybe 30 po points, we're gonna drop the alveolar PO2, and that's when the patient gets into trouble. Alveolar hypoxia leads to hypoxemia,
and they will tolerate hypoxemia much less well than hypercarbia. Uh, Dr. Wessel, as you well appreciate, um, the child surviving hospitalization after a Norwood type procedure um, was once a major milestone and is now a common event. Uh, what about the issues that we need to know about the older child uh, who uh, has hypoplastic left heart syndrome? What are the, some of the key principles to remember in the care of that child who's been repaired? So you're right, Jeff. The survival rates now for the first stage of a three-stage approach to addressing children with single ventricles, in particular hypoplastic left heart syndrome, uh, has seen improvement in survival that's re really substantial. So it's pretty... It's pretty common now to see survival rates of uh, 80%, 85% in some centers. Uh, mortality for the first stage paleation varies uh, across much of the world now between 10 and uh, perhaps 30%. So much better than it was uh, two or three decades ago. There's no question about it. Uh, and then the introduction of the bidirectional gland as an intermediate phase uh, really helped transform the field. Uh, and so when the child comes back at uh, four months of age or so for the bidirectional gland, then the superior vena cava is anastomosed to the pulmonary artery so that blood returns passively through the SV, uh, SVC uh, to become oxygenated uh, and then return back to the heart uh, via the pulmonary veins. And the systemic to uh, pulmonary shunt is taken down, either the sono or the modified BT shunt. So that's an interesting circulation with the pulmonary blood flow coming from the brain. When we have a patient who is uh, quite blue after a bidirectional gland, there's sometimes a tendency to think, oh, the pulmonary vascular resistance must be elevated. Now, for the most part with small shunts, these children don't spend the first three or four months of life at high flow and high pressure in the lungs. So there isn't much reason or basis for us to think they're going to have high pulmonary vascular resistance or reactivity. And in fact, they usually don't. But nonetheless, in the ICU, if a bidirectional gland patient comes back to the operating room and they're quite blue, there's a tendency to ventilate them more. And that increases the time average mean airway pressure. It'll drop the PCO2, raise the pH, and we think that's, that's an approach to high PVR and, and the child will be able to get blood through the lungs more easily now. But in fact, it raises the intrathoracic pressure, probably by raising the time average mean airway pressure, raises pulmonary vascular resistance. And importantly, when the PCO2 goes down, the cerebral blood flow also goes down. So in fact, you can make the patient worse with that strategy. And paradoxically, what uh, has been shown in the literature and we might do is let the PCO2 rise and increase the cerebral blood flow because some rise in PCO2 in this patient population and a drop in pH won't drive pulmonary vascular resistance up very much. And honestly, it's low and small changes aren't gonna have a huge impact. So by raising the PCO2 in these patients, you redistribute that cardiac output to the brain and after the brain, it comes back down into the superior vena cava into the lungs and the PO2 actually goes up. So that's just an interesting observation that many people have made that's a little bit uh, anti-intuitive, I would guess, if you spend uh, a lot of years working on how to lower pulmonary vascular resistance to make uh, patients pinker. Uh, David, now tell us about the care of the patient with Fontan physiology. What should we be thinking about in that regard? Well, as these patients with single ventricle uh, proceed through their bidirectional gland operation and then come to their next phase when they're typically three or sometimes as old as four uh, years of age, they have what's called the Fontan procedure. And, and basically the notion here is there's, there's no pumping chamber on the right side anymore. The pumping cha chamber has been uh, preserved or redirected for the systemic circulation. And so blood comes back from the body to the right side and has to passively flow through the lungs and then back to the ventricle. So that really challenges us in the intensive care unit uh, to manage the pulmonary vascular resistance or the impedance to blood flow in a passive system uh, on the right side. And there are a number of special circumstances that I'd like to just briefly describe because there have been some lessons learned along the way. So first of all, 
When a patient comes back from the Fontan and have a so-called failing Fontan circulation with a very high right atrial pressure, I like people to try to think systematically through exactly where the problem might be that's raising the right atrial pressure. The right atrial pressure doesn't care why there's a problem distally. It just doesn't like high right atrial pressures that will contribute to low cardiac output in the failing Fontan. So I actually go through the circulation and go down into the ventricle and say, all right, why is my right atrial pressure high? Is it because it's seeing distally, after the blood goes through the lungs, a high end diastolic pressure? Maybe there's diastolic dysfunction, there's systolic function, there's volume overload, the EDP is high. And then after I evaluate that, I move up to the AV valve. Is it stenotic or regurgitant? Evaluate that valve. And then you move into the late left atrium. A really important aspect of the left atrium is, what is the rhythm? Is it sinus rhythm? Because it's common for a postoperative Fontan patient to fall into a nodal rhythm where the AV node gets out in front of the sinus node in terms of rate, and there's a retrograde P wave. Well, if you're in the left atrium, and the left atrium is contracting against a closed AV valve with the retrograde P wave, that's going to give you a cannon A wave. And again, the right atrial pressure doesn't care why the left atrial pressure is elevated. It just doesn't like it. And so you have cannon A waves that increase the time average mean left atrial pressure and inhibit flow of blood through the lungs back to the ventricle. So the simple intervention at that point is to, and all these patients have uh, atrial pacing wires, is simply to atrially pace the heart a little faster rate than that nodal rate. So you get the P wave back in front of the QRS, the cannon A waves go away, and the time average mean left atrial pressure comes down typically two or three millimeters of mercury, which in a critical patient can be quite helpful. So from the left atrium, I then move up to pulmonary veins. Is there a problem with pulmonary veins? And then back into the pulmonary vascular resistance itself. Is there an elevation in pulmonary vascular resistance? And then finally, we need to assess the pulmonary artery architecture itself. Sometimes the pulmonary artery was not fully appreciated to be small, perhaps on one size, and one can stent the pulmonary artery, make it larger, and relieve obstruction and facilitate flow of blood passively through the lungs. So that's the way I approach a patient with a failing Fontan circulation, thinking anatomically about what the problems are. So in the Fontan circulation, I want to emphasize one final uh, scenario that happens from time to time that we all need to be very much aware of. Uh, as you may know, the Fontan patient population can be at home and develop pericardial effusions. Um, and these can produce a real urgent tamponade situation. The patient uh, typically, and I distinctly remember uh, another seven-year-old boy who came in to the emergency room I get a call from the emergency room, and uh, the child uh, is uh, seen on echocardiography to have a very large pericardial effusion. And in fact, I remember the echocardiographer telling me it was so big, I, I couldn't miss this. Uh, it, it would be like missing the broadside of a barn. Those were his words. So the patient comes up to the intensive care unit. And they often present as a real dilemma, especially to younger practitioners. The first thing you notice is that the child is awake and talking to you, usually unhappy, crying, fearful, and you try to feel a pulse, and you don't feel a pulse. Now, you know the child is alive because they're bitterly complaining, and they're frightened. The mother is standing nearby and wants something to be done because she knows there's something wrong with their child. Child doesn't look well. You put the automated blood pressure cuff on, and one of the key signs is that the first two times it cycles, it doesn't give you a result. So you have this situation where you're not really able to monitor vital signs very well. You don't feel a pulse, and ordinarily you'd think, I need to do resuscitation, but the patient is screaming at you. Um, and you need to proceed with getting the fluid off. Now, if you take this seven-year-old and show him uh, a long needle, uh, he's not gonna be very happy. The mother's saying, do something. You must do something right now. And so as you prepare the table, you gotta decide how are you gonna manage the airway and the anesthetic. And there's a huge 
force all around you that says, invoke the old, invoke the old, I'll call it the pent sucks tube approach. If you can just give the patient uh, a large enough anesthetic dose to get him really asleep, followed by a muscle relaxant, because the mom tells you that yes, he did eat breakfast, but you know he vomited most of his breakfast. And he's got a lot of abdominal pain because that's what happens with the pericardial tamponade, especially in the Fontan patients, it's expressed with abdominal pain. They have this vomiting. You're thinking full stomach, I have to intubate this patient, put him asleep. And you go with some variation on a drug that is an anesthetic agent that will depress the myocardium, just transiently though. Uh, and then an endotracheal tube that follows after the uh, muscle relaxant. And the first tendency for you as the operator or the respiratory therapist or someone standing beside you is to give, ah, oh, to be relieved and give two or three big breaths. And of course, in the Fontan that's very sensitive to the circulation and passive flow through the heart, if you depress the myocardium, drop the cardiac output a little bit further, and then provide even two or three breaths of positive pressure, you will have no cardiac output and you will have a cardiac arrest. And resuscitating a patient with a Fontan after a cardiac arrest, who at least initially has a large pericardial effusion, is very, very difficult. So the focus has to be instead on a focused approach to the pericardiocentesis itself. This is not a time to ask your colleague to come in and look at the picture and let's have a little, maybe the rounds a team can come over and look at it or let's have a little consensus chat here or maybe we'll take a vote you know, on how to do this. That's not the time. You need an experienced operator who can do this. And remember that broad side of the barn? Well, in fact, there may be a lot of fluid there, but I have found that the Fontan patients are sometimes the most difficult ones to conduct a pericardiocentesis effectively in. They've had at least two prior operations. There's a lot of scar tissue. They're bigger kids. When you put the needle in, you may not be in the pericardial space. You may be in the subdiaphragmatic space. You've got 200, 300 cc's that comes out. It looks great. You're in the right space, you put the wire in, there goes the catheter that's in, you think you're all done, it's draining fine, 200 cc's come out, and in the meantime, uh, you've got a progression of the pericardial tamponade and low cardiac output. So this is not an easy slam dunk pericardiocentesis in a Fontan patients. But coming back to the airway management, the anesthetic management, I think this is a, a case where ketamine, for example, is a very useful drug. You can't feel the pulse, you know the child is alive, you need to get some degree of cooperation from the child, you need to provide some anesthetic. We use ketamine, often preceded with atropine, and we keep the child breathing spontaneously. We provide oxygen to the airway, but we try not to take over with positive pressure ventilation while the operator is gonna do the pericardiocentesis procedure uh, progresses. And so we use ketamine, they breathe spontaneously, uh, uh, when the chest is prepared, I will warn you that the child may respond and bring their hand up as you're trying. So we have to use soft restraints, atropine, ketamine, sometimes a little bit of fentanyl or versed, but be very careful with that and use it only in low doses. And then have the child breathing spontaneously. Avoid intubation. It's usually not necessary for this, although there's some risk, of course, if they're anesthetized, they won't protect their airway if they have passive reflux, and you have to be aware and alert for that. Uh, but breathing spontaneously is really quite important. Not using a drug that will suppress the myocardium, depress the myocardium. And then uh, a very focused approach to get the pericardial synthesis accomplished uh, quickly. And that's the successful algorithm for evacuating pericardial fluid in a Fontan patient. Dr. Wessel, could we ex expand a little bit on that point of um, approaching the patient uh, for airway management who has low cardiac output syndrome? Uh, you may understand the etiology of their ventricular dysfunction, or you may not, but you appreciate that they have low cardiac output syndrome. What is the prudent uh, approach to uh, managing the patient that you're about to intubate uh, in that context? 
So clearly a patient with low cardiac output and poor ventricular performance is a real challenge for us to manage the airway, the anesthetic agent, establish the airway, uh, and to support the cardiovascular status of the patient, typically with inotropic drugs. There are lots of different formulas that one can use, but let me take the example of a patient, let's say a middle-aged patient, an eight or nine or 10-year-old with a severe cardiomyopathy. I don't know if you've ever spent too much time looking at the echocardiograms of these patients, but the ones with severe cardiomyopathies, it looks as if the heart doesn't even squeeze. It tends to rotate a little on its axis, and when you look at the ventricles, they just barely move. And so they are very fragile patients, and we have to decide how to uh, pick an anesthetic agent and how to manage the airway in a fashion uh, especially if they're going on to be cannulated for ECMO or to have a ventricular assist device or go to the operating room for a procedure. So it takes some thoughtful, careful management. Again, the one approach that we want to avoid is a big dose of a anesthetic agent that will depress the myocardium, drop the blood pressure. On the other hand, if you don't use an anesthetic agent at all, these patients are very sensitive to increased afterload. So if they vasoconstrict and get agitated and cardiac uh, output will go down, the mixed venous uh, oxygen saturation goes down, uh, the myocardial uh, oxygen demand uh, goes up as they become tachycardic, and increasing their systemic resistance can have a very adverse impact on their overall hemodynamics. So we don't want to do awake, not sedated, intubations, yet we don't want to use too much medication. And so this is where, it, what in the anesthesia world, we refer to as a, as a cardiac induction is really important. I typically will pick a relatively low dose of fentanyl uh, in the range of two, three, maybe five mics per kilo of fentanyl, along with a low dose of a benzodiazepine, a midazolam typically. But what, what I will also do is make sure that I have running uh, some inotropic support for the heart. And dopamine is often a choice. Some people may have dobutamine already running, but I wanna be able to support this cardiac output because there's gonna be a little depression in cardiac output. And then we do a slow induction of these patients. Uh, we gradually assist the airway with a mask we test the patient to see if they're having a response to various stimuli, because there's nothing like the uh, feel of cold steel from the laryngoscope on your epiglottis to have a stress response elicited in the patient. And they get tachycardic and their blood pressure goes up. And then after their blood pressure and heart rate goes up, if they're too awake, then it comes down and it keeps going down. So you have to find the right balance. Uh, I sometimes have a syringe of uh, calcium with me as well because I know when I give the fentanyl and the midazolam, I might get a little drop in blood pressure and I might want to reverse that uh, with an agent that will just temporarily get the blood pressure back up. And then when the patient is intubated, usually facilitated by a muscle relaxant, uh, we make sure not to give these big breaths. Uh, the breaths need to stay small. The volume of the patient may need to be augmented. The inotropic support may need to be upped for a little bit. And what you want is a smooth induction uh, of these patients. And again, it's not a, a barbiturate, uh, rapid acting muscle relaxant, and then an endotracheal tube and a big breath. Uh, David, thank you. That's a very helpful overview, especially the importance of avoiding excessive uh, minute ventilation or tidal volume after intubation. Could I take you back, though, to, um, you mentioned uh, dopamine for inotropic support. What doses uh, would you be using um, during the induction phase? And also, could you comment a little bit on um, if you prefer a certain type of muscle relaxant in this context? So I, I, I mentioned dopamine, uh, although I, I want to quickly add that if the patient had been symptomatic for a while, was already on inotropic support, uh, many of us would uh, be using a drug like uh, dobutamine uh, to get a little bit of afterload reduction uh, that may be seen with dobutamine that's not seen with dopamine. However, when you're doing an intubation of a patient that's not at that moment on an inotropic agent, I'm more worried about 
systemic blood pressure issues, and so I want a drug that I have a little bit more confidence in will raise the blood pressure. So I would typically just start the patient as I approach his anesthetic and airway management on five mics per kilo per minute of dopamine, uh, and I assess his response. There's a lot of biologic variability in the response, and of course, if you saw a, a significant tachycardia, why you'd want to back off on that. But I usually start some dopamine. Um, I use the, the midazolam and the fentanyl that we talked about. Uh, again, the muscle relaxant, there are choices. I don't think for this particular patient population, there's particular value in having a very rapid acting muscle relaxant like succinylcholine. If you, you, you get good airway control here, but uh, very quickly with uh, sucks, but uh, you would always have to precede it for the most part with atropine. Some of these patients have atrial arrhythmias. You don't want to induce an atrial arrhythmia by giving a dose of atropine. And also, after the endotracheal tube is placed, you want to keep things very smooth and very calm. You don't want the patient to be waking up too quickly and being struggling against the endotracheal tube. Uh, and so I use a, a drug that's going to be a little longer acting, like rocuronium. Um, Dr. Wessel, could we now talk about the late adolescent or even indeed early adult uh, patient with uh, congenital heart disease? What are some fundamental principles we need to recall? Well, as you know, there are many units around the world now that are seeing more uh, patients uh, with adult congenital heart disease than ever before. And in fact, if you look at some of the numbers, it turns out that there are more adults living with congenital heart disease than there are children with congenital heart disease. And so they're finding their ways into our intensive care units in larger and larger numbers. And so we have to make sure that we've got the right teams uh, assembled for it, that we have the right consultations. Uh, we've see we're seeing more um, meds, peds, trained people coming in to work in cardiac ICUs. And I think it's important to have that adult perspective on their disease, as well as a full understanding of the congenital heart lesion. But let me just give you one example that's come up uh, on a number of different occasions. I remember one case uh, of an adult congenital in the unit. It was at a time when we weren't staying overnight in hospital as attending physicians. I was home. I came back to start rounds the next morning. I asked about this particular adult congenital patient, uh, and the word was that he was doing just fine, had been fine all night. And as people that are more pediatric oriented uh, in cardiology and to some extent in critical care as well, we tend to be focused on the vital signs that are peculiar to the infant, especially the neonate. And so a blood pressure of 75 is pretty high for a neonate or an infant. In fact, our surgical colleagues are always worried about exacerbating more bleeding, get that blood pressure down, 75 is too high. And we have a little bit of a mindset that 70 or 80 millimeters of mercury systolic blood pressure for an older patient would be just fine. But the point to make in an adult, especially with a precarious kidney situation, a little bit of low cardiac output scenario going on, a blood pressure of 75 millimeters of mercury systolic is shock. And if they sit all night with that renal perfusion pressure that's so much lower than they might otherwise be used to, it will precipitate acute renal failure in a patient. And indeed, in the patient I described that everything was fine, I noticed first that the creatinine had doubled overnight uh, from 0.8 to 1.6, and then I saw the profile over the previous almost 24 hours of systolic pressures that were typically 70, 75, 80. And if you look at the adult intensive care uh, world, as you know, uh, even better than I, uh, Jeff, that uh, there's a lot more emphasis on treating systemic blood pressure. Drugs like Levofed and other drugs are used to support blood pressure because renal perfusion pressure and other organ system pressure is, is really quite critical. So my comment about the adult, the one little vignette and uh, uh, pearl, if you will, that I'd like to leave with people is to recognize that in an adult patient, the systolic blood pressures of 75, 80, even 85 may represent a form of shock in that patient. And we need to pay attention to the blood pressure in our adult patients. Well, Dr. David Wessel, um, thank you for coming back uh, a second time for the World Shared Practice Forum.
Uh, as you know, there's some science that says that you have to accumulate at least 10,000 hours to be an expert. But over the course of your career over the last 30 years, it's far more than 10,000 hours. But thank you for sharing all of your accumulated clinical wisdom with all of us uh, uh, colleagues around the world. Thank you very much, Jeff. It's a pleasure to be here and I enjoy telling stories and I hope to come back uh, another time. And it's been great to watch this field evolve and I'm sure that it's going to proceed to uh, places I never imagined it could go. This concludes Dr. Wessel's World Shared Practice Forum Master Teacher Series video. If you would like to see additional case discussions by Dr. Wessel, please review them in the Open Pediatrics Library.